The text for the sermon this morning is taken from the book of Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 2. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, Run! Say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee from the land of the north, declares the Lord. For I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in your midst. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, Zechariah has just received a vision of a man among the myrtle trees in which the Lord of hosts encouraged his people by announcing that he would come to them in mercy and not in wrath. The temple and Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The Lord reaffirmed his covenant promises by again choosing Jerusalem Zechariah must have been very encouraged by these words. But the Lord did not leave it at that. No, it appears that the first vision was barely over when Zechariah saw another vision that night. He looked and saw four horns. Zechariah asked the angel who talked with him, What are these? The angel answers, These are the horns that have scattered Judah. Israel and Jerusalem. The horns are presumably those of a bull or some other powerful animal. These horns symbolize strength and brute force. They symbolize the powerful nations which had scattered the Israelites and led them into exile. The fact that there are four horns points to the totality of of the external forces of evil which attacked and scattered God's people. They came, as it were, from the four corners of the earth, from north, south, east, and west, and harassed and spread abroad Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. How horrible are these ugly, powerful horns! What destruction they caused for God's people! Zechariah saw the horns easily. There was no mistaking the evil powers. You couldn't miss seeing them. And we can identify with that. We have no problem seeing the troubles. 
difficulties in our life and in this world. We can become burdened and discouraged by them. And they can skew our perspective. We fail to perceive all the good that is happening as well. And now in the vision, the Lord turns Zechariah's head, as it were, and shows him four craftsmen. These craftsmen had to be shown to Zechariah. Again, Zechariah is perplexed and he asks, what are these coming to do? He is told that the craftsmen are coming to cast down the horns that had scattered God's people. The nations which had terrified and scattered the Israelites will in turn be terrified and scattered and destroyed themselves. Exactly how the craftsmen would go about their task of dealing with the horns is not clear. What is clear is that the Lord meets the challenge of the horns head on. Four craftsmen grapple with the four horns and overcome and terrify them. The positive symbols of skilled strength from the Lord effectively destroy the symbols of brute devilish power. Zechariah had no trouble seeing the horns, the powers of evil, but he didn't notice the craftsmen from the Lord until the Lord showed them to him. The Lord is about to reveal to Zechariah more of his wonders, more of his good things, which he has prepared for his people. Zechariah knew that the Lord would come to Jerusalem in mercy and rebuild the temple and Jerusalem. And he knew that the evil powers would be, which had scattered the Israelites would be effectively dealt with. But the number of the returned exiles seemed so small. And Jerusalem was still in ruins. And open to easy invasion, domination by others. The people of God still seemed so weak and so vulnerable. Was the return from exile really worth it? Undoubtedly, such questions and concerns still plague Zechariah and the godly Israelites. It is into this situation that the word of the Lord comes to Zechariah in the third vision. I proclaim to you God's word under the following theme. The Lord promises the complete restoration of his precious people. We will see first the magnitude of this restoration, second the safeguarding of this restoration, and third the climax of this restoration. Again, Zechariah lifted up his eyes, and this time he sees a man with a measuring line in his hand. In chapter 1, verse 16, the Lord had said that the measuring line would be stretched out over Jerusalem. This meant that the building was about to start. In order to build, it is first necessary to know the measurements of what you are building. This is exciting. Things are looking up. Zechariah asked the man directly, where are you going? Where will the building begin? At the site for the temple? Or perhaps the walls would be built first? The man answers him to measure Jerusalem to see what is its width and what is its length. The man in the vision was going to do some preliminary checking into the dimensions of the whole city to find out how big the walls of the city need to be. Sounds good. Work and the city is getting underway. But the Lord has something much better than that in store for Zechariah the prophet to see. When the man made his answer to Zechariah, the heavenly angels get busy. There is a flurry of activity in the heavenly realms. The angel who talked with Zechariah that mentor angel from the first vision comes forward and another angel 
comes to meet him and tells him to run after the man with the measuring line. That young man was certainly eager about his business. He was hurried off already to measure the dimensions of Jerusalem. Zachariah's mentor angel is ordered to tell the man with the measuring line, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. Forget about measuring, young man. Throw away your measuring line. You won't need it because Jerusalem will be a city without walls. What was that? A city without walls? Did I hear that right? A city without walls was unheard of in the ancient world. Walls were vital for the security of the city. Without walls, a city was defenseless. And it would be easy prey to enemy raiders. Building a city without walls was simply not done. The angel explains why Jerusalem will have no walls. It is because of the multitude of people and livestock which will be in Jerusalem. What an incredible message from the Most High God. Hearing that Jerusalem would have no walls was surprising enough. But now Zechariah hears that this will be because of the large multitude of people. What an amazing word from the Lord of hosts. At the time Zechariah saw this vision, only a small trickle of Israelites had returned to Jerusalem from exile. It would have been easy to build walls to contain the amount of people who had returned to live in Jerusalem. But now the Lord was telling him that great numbers of people would be living in Jerusalem. The Lord was promising the complete restoration of his people. The restoration of God's people would be so complete that it would be even greater than the size of Jerusalem during the time of David and Solomon. The number of people would be so great that the city walls would not be able to contain them. How would this all come about? This is explained in the subsequent verses. In verse 6, the Lord declares, Up, up, flee from the land of the north. And in verse 7, Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. The Lord urgently addresses the Israelites who are still living in exile to return to Jerusalem. The phrase daughter of Babylon refers to the city of Babylon where many Jews were living and leading comfortable lives. The land of the north refers not only to regions directly north of Israel, but also to the east and the west. The reason the north is mentioned is that all the invaders from the north, east, and west of Israel had to approach Israel from the north because of the large desert directly to the east of Israel and the sea to the west. The Israelites were scattered to the four winds of heaven. Besides Babylon, they were to be found in western Assyria and to far media in the east. Now the Lord urgently calls all these exiles to come back to Jerusalem. They must flee and escape the lands in which they are now living, for to remain there is dangerous. There is no hope for them there. To Jerusalem, the city which the Lord has chosen once again, there they must go. Gradually, more and more exiles returned in the years that followed. At the time of Pentecost, after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Jews from all over the known world came to Jerusalem to worship. These Jews came from Parthia, Media, Elam, Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Rome, Crete, 
and Arabia. The restoration of God's people was to be complete. Not just a few Israelites would worship in Jerusalem, but multitudes of them. But it gets even better than this, beloved in the Lord. In verse 11, Zechariah hears that many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day. Not only the Israelites, God's special chosen nation, will come to Jerusalem but many other nations as well. Other peoples will be grafted into the nation of Israel and will join Jerusalem, the city of God. Later in the book of Zechariah, there is another clear prophecy about this. Turn with me to Zechariah 8. At the end of the chapter, verses 20 to 23. There we read the word of the Lord as follows. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Peoples shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another and say, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. See the wonder of God's ways. Jerusalem could have been filled to the brim with only Israelites, but His saving work extends to the very reaches of the whole earth. Jerusalem, the holy city, will be filled with the peoples of all nations. What an incredible message for Zechariah to hear during these despondent times in Israel's history. In our text, in verse 11, we read that many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day. Which day? In our day. That day refers to the last days in which we live. Our Lord Jesus Christ gave the command just before he ascended into heaven. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. In our day, we ourselves here in Canada, far from the land of Israel and Jerusalem, are the result of God's promise of the complete restoration of His people. Because of this promise in verse 11, we also may hear the gospel and believe in the Lord of hosts and so be joined to His people. We may be part of that great multitude in the spiritual Jerusalem. Yet so often we can feel somewhat despondent. God's people seem to be so small. And then we can be walking around with our measuring line. And we have done our measuring, and the outlook doesn't seem to be all that great. A few sister churches sprinkled across the world. Some mission posts here and there with small congregations. Not really all that much, is it? When we catch ourselves thinking like this, And this word of the Lord comes to us. Throw away your measuring line. Forget about your measuring and your calculations. I am the Lord of hosts, the creator of heaven and earth. Do you think that I, the king of kings, will only have a small handful of people as my subjects? I am busy gathering my people. 
from all the peoples and nations. Look and see with the eyes of faith. Look at the work I am doing. Brazil, China, Korea, so many other lands. Truly the work of God is immeasurable and beyond our understanding. Let us continue to work faithfully in the place which God has given us and leave the measuring and the counting up to the Lord. For we cannot even begin to do that with any sort of accuracy. God's work of gathering His worldwide church is too big and too high for us. For after all, it is the Lord of hosts who is doing this work through Jesus Christ, His Son. The Apostle John saw the number of God's elect, those who were sealed. John writes in Revelation 7, After this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The restoration of God's people will be complete and its magnitude immeasurable. But what about the city of Jerusalem without any walls? How would such a multitude be kept secure with no walls? And so we come to the second point, the safeguarding of this restoration. The angel who ran after the young man with the measuring line was told to say more to him. The Lord declares to the angel in verse 5, And I will be to her a wall of fire all around. This is the only time that the expression wall of fire is used in the Old Testament, but its meaning is clear. No enemy or attacker would be able to get through a wall of fire. Burning men, melting swords and helmets are not very effective. None of them would be able to get through the Lord's wall of fire. But that's not quite right. For the wall of fire is a metaphor for the Lord Himself. No stone wall will be built and no wall of fire will be placed around Jerusalem. Instead, the Lord Himself will defend Jerusalem and surround it so that no harm could come to the multitude inside the city. The Lord will not assign the defense and protection of His people to someone else, but He will take personal responsibility for it. There is a very good reason for the Lord to take personal responsibility for the safeguarding of His people. They are very precious to Him. As our text says in verse 8, His people is the apple of His eye. Whoever touches His people touches the apple of His eye. No one lets anything or anyone touch their eye. Our eyelids react instantaneously when some foreign object threatens to hit our eyes. Our eyes are very precious to us. They must be protected at all costs. This is how the Lord of hosts regards the people He has chosen. Already in the Song of Moses, this expression was used to describe His people Israel. In Deuteronomy 32, Moses sings, but the Lord's portion is His people. Jacob, His allotted heritage. He found Him in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. He encircled them. He cared for them. He kept them as the apple of His eye. In this way, the Lord also affirms to Zechariah and the people of His day his rich promises. Nothing has changed in how the Lord regards Israel. 
Just as he guarded Jacob and his descendants in the time of Moses, so he also guards and protects the Israelites in Zechariah's day. God's people are very precious to him. They are the apple of his eye. We who live today in the time of the new covenant may know even more deeply how very precious we are to him. For we know of the tremendous price with which the Lord bought us to be his people. He did not buy us with silver or gold, but with the immeasurably precious blood of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus sacrificed His whole body, including the apple of His eyes. He sacrificed His very life in order to free us from our slavery to sin. Because of this very high cost, we are very precious to the Lord. We are the apple of His eye. Therefore, He surrounds us like a wall of fire. We don't see any kind of physical walls around us and so we might feel vulnerable and unsafe in this world. We can feel overwhelmed with the pressures of our current circumstances. But with the eyes of faith which God in His grace gives to us, we may see the Lord's love and protection. He Himself is a wall of fire surrounding us. And therefore, we are completely safe. Nothing at all in all creation can separate us from His love. We are His precious people, safeguarded, protected by the Lord of hosts Himself. Our text makes clear that there is also an offensive aspect to this safeguarding. For the Lord promises in verse 9, that he will shake or raise his hand against the nations which have plundered his people. When the Babylonian army conquered Judah and Jerusalem and broke down its stone walls, the Babylonians plundered Jerusalem of all of its riches, including all the treasures of the temple. But now the Lord promises a time when the slaves of the Babylonians, that is the Israelites, will plunder the Babylonians. In the ancient Near East, it is to suffer the ultimate humiliation if the master would have to become the slave of his former slave. Nothing could be worse. That is just what will happen in the case of Israel and her enemies. And so Jerusalem will be full, not just of people, but also of livestock, symbolizing the riches of the nations. Zechariah 14, the prophet prophesies, And the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be collected, gold, silver, garments, in great abundance. All this wealth will be gathered and taken into Jerusalem. The Apostle John also states this plainly in Revelation 21, where he writes, The kings of the earth, will bring their glory into Jerusalem. Now, as in Zechariah's day, it seems that the worldly kingdoms have all the wealth and the riches. A part of the promises of the complete restoration of God's people is that all the glory and riches of the nations will become the possessions of the people of God. How that will come about and exactly what is involved with such riches is not completely clear now. But it will be revealed to us on that great and final day. Yet all this promised wealth is as nothing compared to the true climax of the complete restoration of God's precious people. And this takes us to the third point, the climax of this restoration. God has promised that Jerusalem will contain a great multitude of people from all nations and livestock. 
He has promised that He will safeguard His most precious people by surrounding them like a wall of fire. And now, at this point in the vision, the Lord of hosts makes the most amazing promise of all. He promises that He Himself will be the glory of Jerusalem within it. He further expands on this promise in the verses 10 and 11 where He says, Behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst. This is the climax of the restoration of God's people, because this is really what God's promises are ultimately all about, communion and fellowship with God. That communion was destroyed by sin when our first parents rebelled against God. But in His incomprehensible love and grace, ever since that day, God has been working towards the complete restoration of this fellowship with His people. For Zechariah, this promise of God primarily meant the return of God's glory in the temple, which would soon be rebuilt. Then they would once again have the full assurance that God was in their midst, and that the communion with God had been restored, a communion that was shattered by the exile and the expulsion from the land of Israel. Verse 12 makes this hope clear. And the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land and will again choose Jerusalem. Jerusalem will once again hold its place, its special place in God's dealings with his people, especially in his plans for restoring his precious nation. In the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, these words of prophecy have been fulfilled even more richly. In the man Jesus, God himself came down and dwelt among us. His coming was necessary for the restoration of full communion with God the Father. But his stay among us was only for a short time. Once his mission was completed, he had to return to the Father so that the Holy Spirit could be sent to us and dwell in each one of us personally. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out and continues to be given so that we might have faith and believe in the only true God. In this way, right now, God lives among us and in us. As church, we, by God's grace, may be His temple, His dwelling place in this world. Beloved in the Lord, how are you working with this reality in your life? Do you desire to live as God's children and be His temple in this world? Is your whole life and thoughts directed upwards to Him, our faithful, loving, heavenly Father? How are we now already establishing ways of righteousness and holiness in our daily life, preparing ourselves for eternal fellowship with God. If we are sliding away from the Lord, or not living as earnestly before Him as we should, now is the time to repent and come back to Him. Set Him as your highest joy in your life. Do not hinder the work of the Spirit of Christ in you, but be awed at His presence and seek to honor and glorify Him in all that you do. In our daily life, we all need to deal with the pain and results or reality of sin. Through our sin, we still build barriers and dig chasms that block our communion with God. So often, we do not seem to notice the Holy Spirit or appreciate the impact of His presence. While we do have communion with God, in this life it is fragmentary, partial, 
far from complete, whole, and pure. But God promises complete communion with him. Also to us, God promises the complete restoration of his precious people. It is coming. In Revelation 21, the Apostle John writes, And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. and They will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain any more. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. On that great day, the climax of the complete restoration of God's people will be evident to everyone. Then we will see God as He is and not die. Then we will have complete communion with Him. He will be our glory, our everything. Then we will speak to Him and He will speak to us directly. For then all barriers and obstacles will have been completely removed. Now we must live by faith, but then we will live by sight and we'll see the glory of God forevermore. How are we to respond to these wonderful promises? Verses 10 and 13 tell us, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, Rejoice, for God's promises give hope and perspective to a despondent, downtrodden people. Sing His praises and laugh with gladness because of His marvelous promises. For the Lord is coming, and He will live among us in complete harmony and communion. Verse 13 contains another command. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for He has roused Himself from His holy dwelling. Be silent here can also be translated be still. It does not simply mean to be quiet, but rather to be filled with reverent awe. Be filled with wonder at the great works which God is performing for us out of mere grace alone. For God has roused himself from his holy dwelling. He is on the move right now. He is actively working at fulfilling his promises. We cannot accomplish anything ourselves towards bringing about the restoration of God's people. It is all God's work alone. Let us wait for him and be diligent in the calling which he has given us. Let us witness to others of his glory and compassion and love. May they see his spirit at work in us. Do not try to measure or circumscribe his work, for it cannot be measured. And the magnitude of his restored people from many nations is far above all human reckoning. He will safeguard us, his people, For we are very precious to him. We are the apple of his eye. Rejoice and be filled with awe. For on that great day which is sure to come, he will come to dwell with us. And we will live with him forever into all eternity. Amen.